So we've just learned the values of all the pieces and how to set them up. Now we'll learn how they move. The chess pieces might seem strange to you at first, but soon they'll feel natural, almost a part of you. Let's begin with the unit of value in chess, the pawn. Individually, pawns are the least powerful of all pieces, but there are more of them on the board than any other piece, so it's essential to learn how to use them in coordination. The game begins with each side possessing eight pawns all lined up on the second and seventh rank, as you've learned. In the beginning of the game, the primary function of the pawn is to take control of the center of the board and to protect the king. So this is how the pawn moves. On each pawn's first move, it has the option of moving ahead one square or two. It's very important to remember that after its first move, pawns can only move ahead one square at a time. So here this e2 pawn can move to either e3 or e4, because it's that pawn's first move. But once it's on e4, it can only move to e5. The pawn possesses a number of unique qualities. First of all, the pawn is the only piece that cannot move backwards. So as we'll explore in part three of the academy, we have to be careful not to overextend our pawn structure. You'll see more about that later. Also, the pawn is the only piece that captures differently from how it moves. Pawns move straight ahead, but they capture diagonally. This is tricky. So in this position, the white d3 pawn can capture black's pawn on c4, but not the black pawn on d4. In this position, the white pawn on d3 can't move at all. It's blockaded by the black pawn on d4, and there's nothing for it to capture. Despite being small, each pawn has enormous potential. The pawn's greatest power is called promotion. Anytime a pawn successfully journeys to the end of the board, it can transform into any other chess piece on the board, except for the king, of course. A queen, rook, knight, or bishop. We almost always promote into a queen, but there are rare exceptions which I'll show you a bit later. Highlight all the legal pawn moves. You got it! In this position, what do you think white should do? Good job. White can capture the pawn and will soon promote. In this position, it's white's move. Who do you think will promote first, white or black? Good job. White's pawn can move faster because of its two-move head start. h4. Then black will play a5. White plays h5, a4, h6, a3, h7, a2, h8. White gets there faster. This exercise is a little bit trickier. It's black's move. What would you play? Good job. After black plays e5, white's position self-destructs because the only possible pawn moves loses a pawn. After e5, white's forced to play d4, after which black can capture. There's a term for this type of position in chess called zugzwang. What this means is that if I'm in zugzwang, any move that I make will hurt my position. I'm paralyzed, but I'm forced to move. So here you can see that come across on the board. If it's white's move, the only legal move is d3 to d4, after which black can capture the pawn. Now interestingly, if it was black's move and he played e4, the only legal move, white could capture that pawn. So in fact, this is a position of mutual zugzwang, which means whosoever move it is will be in a big disadvantage. Take a look at this setup. It's a little bit more complicated. Let's say you have the black pieces. White has two options, either e3 or e4. Let's take a look at both. If I play e3, what should you do? Good job. Now my only option loses the game for me, as we saw last example. After e4, you can capture the pawn. Now let's look at this position and say that I play e4 on the first move. What would you do? That's right. Here your best move is f6, once again paralyzing me. If I play e5, which is my only option, you can capture the pawn f takes e5. So in this position we can see that if white plays e3, black's best move is f5. If white plays e4, black's best move is f6. And in both cases, 
White will lose a pawn because he had to move first. So in fact, if you go back, whosever move it is in this position will lose. Take some time and work that out on your own. Take a look at this position. What's White's best move? Good job. The point here is that any move that Black makes will self-destruct Black's and Zook's Wong. If he plays c4, d takes c4, wins a pawn. If he plays d5, e takes d5, wins the game. And if he plays g5, White can play h takes g5. Now we're going to have to learn one of the more tricky rules of chess, en passant, French for in passing. This is how it works. Let's say that a white e-pawn has advanced to the fifth rank. Effectively, this pawn is keeping an eye on the f and d-pawns of black because of the following rule. If either of those pawns advances two squares, the white pawn has the option of capturing it diagonally, as if it only moved one square. So if d5, white can play e takes d6. There are two important stipulations to remember. First of all, this is a one-shot deal. If white chooses not to capture the pawn immediately after d5, then he'll lose the chance forever. Also, say white has a pawn on e5 and black has a pawn on d6. If black plays d6 to d5, white cannot capture en passant. This rule only applies if a pawn has moved two squares forward, passing an enemy pawn that is residing on its fifth rank. And don't forget that you only have one chance. Here are a couple exercises that involve en passant. So in this position, black plays d5. Show me all white's possible captures. Good job, but there's more. Keep looking. Good job, but there's more. Keep looking. Good job. Pawns capture diagonally, whether it's en passant or a normal capture. In this position, black plays b5. Show me all white's possible captures. Good job. The only capture is c takes d6. Now let's learn about the king. The king is the most valuable piece in the game, because if we lose him, it's all over. The goal in chess is to capture the enemy king while providing sufficient protection to your own king. But despite its precious nature, the king is not terribly mobile. In this position, the white king on e5 can move to all of these squares. It's easy to remember how the king moves. It can move one square in any direction, as long as that square isn't defended by an enemy piece. So here the white king can move to any of these squares. In this position, with the king on c2, the king can move to these squares. So remember, a king can move diagonally, horizontally, or vertically one square whenever it wants to. In the beginning of the game, we want to keep the king safe, protect him behind a phalanx of pawns. But later, when there is less danger lurking, we can use the king actively. With its dependable pattern of motion, the king can be a very powerful short-range warrior. It's critical to learn how to judge when the appropriate time is to activate the king. I'll develop this in the endgame section of the course. So you know how the king moves. We also know that the goal in chess is to capture the king. Whenever the king is threatened, it's called check. In this position, if white plays the pawn from e4 to e5, we know that pawns capture diagonally, the black king is in check. This is marked with a plus mark, by the way, in notation. So here this would be e5, check. The black king would have to move, and we can see that the black king could move to e6, e7, d7, c7, or c6. The black king couldn't move to c5 or d5, or capture on e5 because the white king defends those squares. It's an illegal move for a king to ever move to a square where it can be captured. This is called check. So when you're in check, you can just move out of the way. The real goal in chess is checkmate. In this position, white can play e7, which is checkmate. The black king is attacked, but it can't move anywhere. The c8 and e8 squares are defended by the white d7 pawn. The e7 pawn of white attacks the black king, and the white king defends that pawn, defends the d7 pawn, and also guards the c7 square. Black can't go anywhere. This is called checkmate. This is your goal in chess. 
There's one more way for the game to end. In this position, it's White's move. What can he do? Well, any answer you gave would have to be wrong, because there's no square you can move to. C1 and E1 are guarded by the black D2 pawn. E2, D2, and C2 are guarded by the black king. So in fact, white can't move anywhere, but white's not in check. This is called stalemate. The game is drawn. So we know if we attack the king, it's check. The king can move away. If we attack the king and the king can't go anywhere, that's checkmate. The game is over and the player who delivered the checkmate wins. Stalemate is when you cannot make any legal moves with your king, but you're not in check. The game is drawn. Now let's do some exercises to get used to king moves. Here, touch all the squares the white king can move to. That's right. Remember, the king can never move into a position where it can be captured. In this exercise, white's in check. What do you think the best move is? Good job. The white king can capture the d4 pawn. Of course, taking the f5 pawn is bad, because it puts the king in danger. Here the white king is in check. What is white's only legal move? Good job. The only unprotected square is f4. Here, white is in check. What's the best move? Good job. It turns out the white can get out of check and checkmate with the same move. By capturing the black pawn with your pawn, you've placed the black king in checkmate. In this position, it's white's move. I'd like you to take a moment and think it out. Stalemate is a theme here. White to play. Good job. By moving your king to e6, you force the black king to move to c7, and you can now play king e7, followed by promoting your pawn on d8. Black will eventually lose. The rook is a very powerful piece, worth five pawns. In this position, the rook on e5 can touch any of these squares. The rook can move as far as it wants to, horizontally or vertically until a piece stands in its way. So, in this position, this rook can move to any of these squares. Now, if there were a pawn, say, on c6, the rook could only move to these squares, and it would also have the option of capturing the black pawn on c6. Rook on c3 takes c6. The rook is an excellent long-distance operator. We want him on open lines because he can't jump over other pieces. On an empty board, the rook controls the same number of squares whether placed in the center or the side of the board. As we'll see later, this is very unusual. Most chess pieces are much more powerful when centrally placed. Let's practice moving the rook around. In this exercise, move the rook to the b1 square. You got it. Here, take two moves to move the white rook to the g7 square. That's right. What's the next move? You got it. In this position, can the black rook capture a white pawn? That's right. As you know, the king is the most important... As you know, the king is the most important piece in your chess army. Protecting your king from attack is how you keep from losing the game. Because it's so important, there's a special move called castling which you can use to put your king in a safe place. Castling is the only time in chess in which you're allowed to move two of your pieces, a king and a rook, in one move. Here's a board set up with only the white king and the two white rooks. You can castle either to the king's side, which is called castling short, or to the queen's side, which is referred to as castling long. In this exercise, we'll castle king's side. First, move the king two spaces towards the rook, to g1. Then move the rook to the other side of the king, on f1. Good work. In this exercise, we'll castle queen's side. 
move the king two spaces towards the rook to c1, and move the rook to the other side of the king, to d1. Excellent work. In a game, castling moves the king away from the center of the board where it's more vulnerable to attack. Note how much safer the two kings are after the castle. Here, white castles queenside, and black castles kingside. It's usually a good idea to castle early in a game, both to protect the king and give the rook a chance to control the center files. There are four important rules that govern castling. Rule number one, the king and rook may not have moved from their starting squares. In this board setup, white cannot castle to either side because both rooks have moved from their starting positions. Even if one of the rooks moves back, white still cannot castle. Rule number two. All of the spaces between the rook and the king must be unoccupied. In this diagram, white cannot castle kingside because the knight is in the way. But he can castle queenside because all of the spaces between the king and the rook are empty. Rule number three, the king cannot be in check. In this position, it would appear that white can castle kingside because neither the king nor the rook has moved from its starting square, and the spaces between the rook and the king are empty. However, the white king is currently in check from the black pawn on d2, so he cannot castle. Rule number four, the squares that the king passes over cannot be under attack, and since you can never move your king into check, the square to which it's moving can't be under attack either. In this position, the spaces between the king and the rook on the queen side are open. However, the d1 square is guarded by the black rook on d8, so the white king cannot pass over it. Castling is illegal. In this position, the c1 square is guarded by the black rook on c8, so the king can't land on it. Castling is illegal here as well. Now that you know how the rook moves, let's take a look at a few checkmates. In this position, white can actually checkmate the black king in one move. Do you see it? Yep, that's it. The black king is trapped on the back rank. The white king guards the d7, e7, and f7 squares, and the white rook mates the king. This is called a back rank mate. Here's another variation of the back rank mate. White to move. Do you see it? Yep, that's it. Rook a8 once again is checkmate. And here the white king doesn't need to help out because the pawns on f7, g7, and h7 are trapping the black king. Notice how our own pieces can hurt us. This is once again called a back rank mate. In this position, there are a lot of pieces on the board. But if we're familiar with the back rank mate, we should be able to spot it here. Black to move. What do you see? Good job. The correct move is rook a1, checkmate, a back rank mate. It's important to learn the patterns on an empty board so we can have the tools to navigate the complexities of chess. I call this exercise monster rook. Here, calculate how the white rook can take all the black pieces in sequence without any breaks. No problem. White to move, mate in one. Good job. Your rook on h6 covers the sixth rank, while your king covers the b4 and b5 squares. By moving your rook to a2, you've checkmated the black king. White to move, mate in one. That's right, rook takes a4, checkmate. Here it's white to move and mate in one. What's the best move? That's it. By moving your rook to h8, you've checkmated the black king, and there's no way to block.
In this position, it's mate and two moves. What is Black's first move? Good job. Now it's mate and one move. What is the last move? You got it. By using both of your rooks in this manner, you're forcing the white king into a smaller and smaller area, until finally he's trapped and can't escape. This one's tricky. Take your time, remember everything you've learned so far, and try to find white's best move. You may see that you can take one of black's rooks with rook takes h5, but that would be a huge mistake. Why? What is black's best move? That's right. If you take on h5, black has rook e1, back rank mate. The tables are turned. So now let's go back to the original position. What should white do? Find the strongest sequence of moves. Good job. Now it's mate in two moves. What's next? You got it. Now it's mate in one move. What's the last one? Excellent work. You found mate in three. Congratulations. In this position, it's white to move in mate in two. This problem combines pawn and rook moves, using a number of patterns you've already seen. White to play. What do you see? Good job. Checking the black king. Your rook is cutting me off from going backwards, so after king h4? What's mate in one here? Rook h6. Excellent work. A back rank mate on the side of the board. Take a look at this position. What's white's best move? That's right. Here we can use the tactical device called a skewer to win the black rook. Rook d3 check skewers the black king to the rook. After king e4, rook takes d8, and white has won a rook. So rook takes g3 was possible winning a pawn, but the best move was rook d3. A skewer is when you have two enemy pieces lined up on the same diagonal, rank, or file. You attack the stronger piece. It has to move out of the way and that opens up an x-ray attack onto the weaker piece. Excellent long-distance operators like the rook, bishop, or queen are very good for these types of operations. Now we're ready to learn about a quirky long-distance operator, the bishop. Bishops can move as far as their path is unblocked along the diagonal. So in this position, the bishop can move to any of these squares. The major drawback of a bishop is that it can only touch the squares in the color on which it travels. So a bishop that begins on dark squares can only touch the 32 dark squares in the chessboard. Of course, a bishop that begins on a light square can only touch the 32 light squares on the chessboard. So we call our bishops a dark squared bishop or a light squared bishop. So while a bishop can go very far with one move, it's relegated to only half the squares in the chessboard. This is why the bishop is worth only three pawns. In this type of position, the bishop can slice right through white's pawn structure, but it can never attack any of the white pawns because they're all in dark squares. So here you can see both the pros and the cons of a light-squared bishop. Like every other piece except for the pawn, the bishop captures the way it moves. It cannot jump over other pieces. And if a bishop is blocked in by its own pawns, it's considered a bad bishop. You always want to maximize the mobility of your chess pieces. Here, the white bishop is blocked in by its own pawns and can't do anything active. The black bishop, on the other hand, is free to roam and can attack the white pawns on dark squares. In this position, black is winning because he has the better bishop. Now let's take a moment to talk about quality in chess. We say that each piece has a numerical value. Bishops are worth three pawns. Rooks are worth five pawns. But in fact, the values of pieces fluctuate with the board position. And it's important to learn about the principles which determine what makes a given kind of piece more or less powerful. It turns out, for instance, that bishops are much better in open games than in closed games. An open game, by the way, is when the central pawn structure is not blocked. In this position, the pawns are wide open, so the bishop can cut through the whole position. Here, on the other hand, the bishops are locked in by the pawns. Knights, on the other hand, while they're also worth roughly three pawns, are better in closed games. We'll learn about the knights soon, but for now just remember that knights are the only piece that can jump over other pieces. So in a closed game, a knight can leap into attack while other pieces are locked in. So if you have a bishop against a knight, you want to open up the game. With knowledge of these principles, as they'll be taught in this course, you'll be able to make long-term strategic decisions, even in your first weeks of play.
Just to show you the power of centralization in chess, and also to show you the power of the bishop, take a look at this position. Here white's two bishops on d5 and e5 cover all of these squares. But of course notice that the white bishop alone only covers these, and the black bishop covers the rest. So the power of two bishops is very important to understand. In chess we refer to one side or another as having two bishops. So while a bishop is worth three pawns and a knight is worth three pawns, usually two bishops together are better than a bishop and a knight because they complete each other. Let's try out some exercises. This we call monster bishop. Black to move and take all the white pieces consecutively, capturing one piece per move. Good job, you found the right sequence to capture all the white pieces. Take a look at this position. First, click on all the black pieces that the white bishop can capture. Good. Now, what is white's best move? Capturing pieces is very tempting, but always remember to look for the best move in chess. Excellent work. Bishop d4 is checkmate and ends the game right away. Here white has two bishops for a rook. What is white's best move? I'm sure you see that the black rook is attacking the h2 bishop. Bishop f4, very good. King b1. What's the next move? Bishop e4 check, excellent work. Driving the king all the way to the corner of the board, king a1. What's mate in one here? Excellent work. Bishop e5 checkmate. A critical pattern, similar to the way you used two rooks earlier to trap a king. Here you've used your two bishops in the same manner. It's white to move here. What's the best move? The first thing you should do is notice all of the black pieces that can be captured. Why don't you highlight them? Good job. Now which is the most valuable piece that can be taken? White had three options and you found the best move. Way to go. In this position, look for all your moves. White to play. What do you see? Remember, bishops can cover a lot of distance. Do you see mate in one? Rook h8 mate. Great work. The rook is supported by the bishop on the opposite corner of the board. Here it's white's move, but be careful to find the best move. What do you see? Rook takes f5 is a big mistake. Notice that now black has absolutely no legal moves. The game is drawn by stalemate. Try again. Excellent work. Rook b6 mate combines the rook and the bishop to win the game. Sometimes when we're closest to victory, we release the tension of the game and throw everything away.
Once again in this position, you want to find the best move. White to play. Good job. Force the black king to move out of danger and win a rook for free. What is white's best move? This one is tricky and it introduces a new idea, a tactic called the fork. Good job. Bishop takes c5, check wins a pawn and a rook because it forks the king and the rook. A fork, of course, is like a fork in the road. We'll discuss this tactical idea later on. But it's when one piece attacks two enemy pieces at once. Bishop takes c5 check is very strong. Don't worry if you had trouble with this one. This was the first time forks were discussed, and you'll be learning more about these in the upcoming exercises. I just wanted to show you the idea. Now for the queen. Now for the queen. She's the most powerful piece on the chessboard. The queen combines the powers of the rook and the bishop and is worth nine pawns. Or two bishops and a knight, two knights and a bishop, a rook, bishop, and pawn, or any other combination of pieces. Of course, these valuations vary with the position, and we have to learn how to make the judgments. So as I mentioned, the queen combines the powers of the rook and the bishop, so she can move as far as she is unblocked, horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. So this queen on the central square controls all of these squares. A really powerful piece. Here, mark all the black pieces that can be captured by the queen. Good job. And now capture the most valuable piece. Good job. The rook on g7 was the most valuable piece to be captured. Here, find mate in one. Way to go. Queen b2 is checkmate. Here, white has mate in one. Do you see it? Good job. Queen d6 is checkmate. The white pawn on c5 guards the d6 square, and the black king has nowhere to go. Do you see mate in one here? White to move. Good job. Queen g7 is checkmate. What is white's best move? Good job. Queen d5 check wins the rook with a fork. In this position, white has mate in one. Do you see it? This is a little tricky. Take a moment. Excellent work. The only way to checkmate is to promote your pawn. A8, queen. Checkmate. Here white has mate in one again, but this one's very tricky. Take your time. Good work. The right move is king g6, checkmate. A discovered attack. A discovered attack is when you can move one piece, opening up the attack of another piece. In this position, the white queen on b3 is blocked in its attack on the black king on g8 by a white rook on d5. When that white rook moves, it's a discovered attack. The white queen will have discovered check onto the black king. Notice, of course, that if white plays either rook d8 check or rook g5 check, the king is attacked two ways. This is called a double check. Very powerful. In part two of the course, when we build you a tactical arsenal, we'll spend more time with discoveries. For now, I just want you to be familiar with the term. Here's another example of a discovered attack. The white pawn can move from d5 to d6, opening up a discovered check on the black king from the bishop on g2. There are countless forms of discovery, and we'll look at more later on. What is white's best move? Find the best discovery.
Good job. Rook d5 check wins the black queen. The white rook moves out of the way, opening up an attack of the white queen on a1 onto the black king on g7 and attacks the black queen. Notice that rook takes b4, another option, would have been a mistake. It also attacks the black queen and checks. But here black can block queen to e5, protected by the pawn on d6. Black gets out of check and gets the queen out of the way. Now we're up to a unique piece, the knight. The knight is the only chess piece that can jump over other pieces, but it can't go very far in one leap. It moves in an L pattern, two squares in one direction and one square in another, or step, step, side, as my mother puts it. So if the knight is here on d5, it can move to these squares, step, step, side, or step, step, side. It's also interesting to note that the knight always moves from a light square to a dark square, or vice versa. Because of its counterintuitive style, sometimes the knight can be confusing. So let's look at a graphic that might help you out. In this graphic, you can see how many moves it takes the knight to reach each square. If you click on that square, Chess Master will play out the knight's path to reach it. By watching these movements, you'll start to become familiar with the flow of the knight. In this graphic, you can see how many moves it takes the knight to reach each square. If you click on that square, Chess Master will play out the knight's path to reach it. By watching these movements, you'll start to become familiar with the flow of the knight. In this graphic, you can see how many moves it takes the knight to reach each square. If you click on that square, Chess Master will play out the knight's path to reach it. By watching these movements, you'll start to become familiar with the flow of the knight. In this graphic, you can see how many moves it takes the knight to reach each square. If you click on that square, Chess Master will play out the knight's path to reach it. By watching these movements, you'll start to become familiar with the flow of the knight. In this graphic, you can see how many moves it takes the knight to reach each square. If you click on that square, Chess Master will play out the knight's path to reach it. By watching these movements, you'll start to become familiar with the flow of the knight. In this graphic, you can see how many moves it takes the knight to reach each square. If you One thing you should notice is that the knight on d5 takes four moves to get to b7 or f7. Diagonally with one square in between is very far for a knight. So you can be very close to a knight, but safe from attack. A knight is very good in a closed game because it can jump over other pieces. We also want to find outposts for the knight. An outpost is a square deep in the enemy camp that an enemy pawn cannot attack. Click on all the squares defended by the knight. The knight can cover eight squares when placed in the center of the board. Good job. It's very important to notice how powerful the knight is in the middle of the board. The center is a theme we'll keep on coming back to throughout this academy. Now in this position, touch all the squares the knight attacks. Good job. The knight can cover four squares on the side of the board. Of course, you remember the knights touched eight squares when in the center of the board. Now in this position, click on all the squares defended by the knight. Exactly. The knight can only cover two squares from the corner of the board. So the knight in the corner covers two squares. The knight in the side covers four squares. The knight in the center covers eight squares. 
We always want to centralize our knight. And this holds true with most of the chess pieces. Centralized pieces can go right, they can go left, they can go up, they can go down. They can go everywhere. With the knights, my first teacher used to always tell me, a knight on the rim is grim. It's a good way to remember to centralize your knights. This exercise will be good for training visualization. How many moves will it take the knight to get to g6? That's right. In this position, how many moves will it take the knight to get to b1? Good job. How long will it take the knight to reach the g3 square? Good job. How many moves will it take for the knight to reach a8? Excellent work. The most common weapon of a knight is the fork. Do you see how the white knight can attack all of black's pieces if moved to the appropriate square? Good work. Knight c7 check. You can attack all of the black pieces. What is black's best move? Here we see that black has two possible forks. Play the best one. Good job. Knight b4 check wins the queen. When deciding between two possible forks, always go for the most valuable pieces. In this position, you can combine the bishop and knight to mate in two. That's right. Knight h6 check forces the black king to take refuge on h8 because the white bishop guards the f8 square. Now you have mate in one. Do you see it? Bishop c3 checkmate. The knight in h6 guards the g8 square, the white king guards h7, and the bishop on c3 delivers the final blow. So here you can see that white uses the bishop, the knight, and the king to corral the black king. Coordinating your pieces in this way is central to attacking chess. Remember the theme of discovered attacks. Anywhere the white knight moves will open up a discovered check from the white queen on c3. Knights are very good for discoveries. What's your best move? Good job. The key idea is to move the knight to a square that sets up a support mate. After knight h5 check, the black king has to move, either to g8 or h7. In either case, there's mate in one for white. Do you see it? Now mate in one. Queen g7 checkmate. The knight in h5 guards the g7 square, and the queen finishes the game. So here you see queen and knight coordinating together. As a general rule, queen and knight is usually a little stronger than queen and bishop, because the bishop and queen are a little bit redundant, while the queen combines with the unique powers of the knight to be a devastating attacking force.